This episode of the Roast West Coast Coffee Podcast is sponsored by Leap Coffee Roasters. Their new roastery location in Escondido has been pumping out some incredible coffees available right now on www.leap.coffee. And check out their innovative new products like Cold Brew XL Lattes, which you can take home by the growler. Follow their Instagram at Leap Coffee for updates on their Roastery Saturday events when they open the doors at 1260 Industrial Ave Escondido. There you can meet the roasting team and pick up a bag or five of coffee. Again, head to www.leap.coffee for details. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Roast West Coast Coffee Podcast where we interview the coffee professionals of the West Coast, and we try to get a little coffee smarter in the process. I am your host, Ryan Wolt. Today, Siri Simran Kulsa, the esteemed director of coffee at Lofty Coffee Company, is back for the last time on season two for a rolling discussion on sustainability, sexism, and what coffee is meant to us both. You can actually hear me getting coffee smarter in this episode. But first, a quick correction. On Tuesday's show, an interview with the team from Coatel Coffee Company, I said that Nahuatl was a Mayan language and that Quetzalcoatl was a Mayan creator deity, but it is actually more often attributed to their neighbors, the Aztecs. I'm not sure why I had Mayan on the brain, and my apologies for the mistake. Today's Coffee Smarter is fantastic, if I do say so myself, and pretty in-depth. When Siri and I talk, sometimes we go on tangents, then we loop back around before moving forward. So if you want to multitask while listening to the show today, that's cool, I get it. I listen to podcasts while hiking or even while writing the show. Check out at Lofty Coffee Co. on Instagram and head to roastwestcoast.com to sign up for the newsletter subscription. Then fill up your coffee mug because it is time for series last Coffee Smarter session of season two. Thanks for listening to the show. Yeah, you know, I've done over a hundred podcast interviews this year. Uh Uh-huh. But I've never done one in real life. So I'm kind of nervous about like transitioning out. Is that is that what we're gonna start do are you gonna start doing in person recordings? I would like to, yeah. Um, this is the last interview that I'm like that I have to do for season two and then and I'm not doing interviews with the newspaper right now, so everything's kind of on pause and yeah. for a couple of uh, months. So I'm assuming by the time this comes back I'll be able to do them in person. But I all of these shows started after we went into quarantine last March. And so I've never had to like record someone in real like while I was sitting across from them or you know have these conversations in person honestly I think you're gonna love it it's gonna be I think (laughs) it's gonna be that much better like I I'm I over the last year have gotten a lot more comfortable and used to this type of communication like uh with Lofty I've been doing some events that have been virtual which has been interesting um with like technical difficulties and also like not being able to see and hear other people. That's always a weird one. So I'm sure it'll be really fun. I think it'll be, it's going to be a new skill set to learn. Yeah. I've only just started going into the world. And so even like those small interactions have been like, it's like practice. Like I, I have been scheduling practice, social interactions with people so I can get used to it before I have to like have some sort of like real event that I need to do. Yeah. Uh, but we should get started. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Siri, uh, one last time, welcome back to the Roast West Coast podcast, season two of Coffee Smarter. I've got a big show planned for us today. But before I start asking any serious questions, I want to say congratulations. You and your team just achieved a huge goal. You opened a new cafe in downtown Carlsbad Village, California, if you were listening to this and you are not in California. Uh, It literally just opened like two weeks ago. What has the reception been like and what does it feel like to see all that work come to fruition? Yeah, well, Brian, thank you so much for having me back on. This has been really fun. Out of all the podcasts I've done, this one it feels the most focused, which is really fun, where the other ones are like more conversational. And it, it's really great to like, 
get to the point and talk about the things that we're really passionate about. So thank you. Um, and to, to answer your question, yes, we just opened a new cafe um, right on State Street in Carlsbad Village. And it has been incredible. It has been the quickest like build out launch of a cafe that um, with my time at Lofty, that's like the quickest, I think within six months, it kind of became this beautiful cafe. And my word for it is it's iconic. It is such a beautiful space. <laughs> Big props to Eric, the CEO of Lofty Coffee. He's the CEO and founder. And he just has this amazing, beautiful eye for design and creating these places that feel really special. And to be a part of that has been really, really amazing. I had a very big hand in just helping train the team and kind of was really involved in the first couple of weeks of getting that place open. Although we are a small team at Lofty, we all kind of have to wear different hats. So despite my role as director of coffee and green buying and roasting, kind of really helping a lot in getting that place in good footing to launch. Um, it seems like there's been an amazing reception. I think that the there's a lot of opportunity in that area for cafe concepts and restaurants and whatnot. And it seems like we're filling like a little space that maybe needed to be filled. And I think there's more places that are going to be able to um, do that as well. There's everyone's just so welcoming, steady state, Baba, everyone like, in the close proximity has been very welcoming, uh, including the guests that were that are coming in. A lot of our regulars actually from Encinitas are like, oh, we're so happy you're here because now we don't have to go all the way to Encinitas to get lofty coffee. And uh, yeah, I'm just, it's kind of crazy. Once the door opens, it's like, there's no one going back now. So we just have <laughs> <laughs> to figure out all the little things that come up here and there throughout that process because like, that's retail. It's like every day there are fires to put out. <laughs> um, and just we're having a really amazing team there uh, to get that place on good footing is great. But another shout out to Yvonne. He's our general manager there who's putting in a lot of work to, to make sure that that place is up and running to a lofty standard. And yeah. <laughs> to a lofty standard. That's a pun. And that really was awesome. I was like, you planned that whole speech to end on a lofty pun, which just makes me happy. I'm actually really happy about the cafe too. I live right near there. I mean, that whole street is being kind of like redesigned. Yeah. Into this. Even though I live so close, I just haven't been out and about in that area a lot over the past year. It's less than a few blocks away. But every time I go down the street, there's something new to look at or some new building or some something's been redone or has continued to be built. And so it's going to just be a beautiful, hopefully walkable uh, street. I know there's rumors that State Street could become walkable in the future. That's exciting, especially with the, with the farmer's market right there. I think it it's a long shot, but I think it's possible. Yeah. Since we are talking about the new cafe, in previous shows, you've brought up things that are important to you about sustainability and green friendly and things like that. I'm wondering, what does that mean to you in terms of the coffee business? Are there sustainable ways to roast coffee? Um, or are you referring to more about how a cafe runs and how much of that? I guess I guess the question would be, what responsibility do you think a roastery or a cafe has to promote sustainability and green coffee practices, despite the inherent waste of hospitality. That was always something that is stressful for someone who cares about climate or the environment or anything. When you work in hospitality, even if you are doing the best possible job, it feels a little bit like fighting an uphill battle because of the natural waste or because we're still at a transition period where having, uh, say, recyclable products or compostable products, we're just as much as we might think we are, we're not quite there yet. Even compostable products are really only compostable in certain situations, which people don't realize. And so you're always trying to find what is what is best both for uh, the environment and also for the business. How do you, I just asked a lot of questions. Do you want me to start that over? And no, ask, I, I think ask I, it again I, or do you I follow me? I got it all. And actually it's funny you say that because 
when we talk about sustainability, there's so many, there is, yeah, like reducing waste, but then there's also like the sustainability of running a business. And that's actually, I'm going to touch on a few different things here. And one of them that's been a really common conversation right now in where like the industry's at and where like the job market's at is the sustainability within actually running a cafe and hiring people. I I love to bring this up because I don't know, I've been seeing memes here and there, but I'm not sure how many people are aware of how difficult it is to hire right now, whether it being people moving on from the service industry or people being in a place where they don't need to work right now and trying to find a more healthy balance of like work and life. But we've been having these conversations of how do we create a sustainable like team that sticks around and who's invested, then we're investing in them. And it's kind of this like we're a team working together to create not only these other types of sustainability that I'll talk about in a minute, but how we can like have a sustainable operation so that we're not having as much turnover and that we're creating a more consistent experience for our guests because not everyone knows like hi like having to like bring people on and train them and then have them leave like a couple months later while of course some people work in this industry kind of as like um an interim position uh it's really not a very it's not very sustainable for businesses because it's a it's a lot goes into one person and i think that goes into saying I think it's it's on both ends, you know, having to make sure that the the companies that are hiring people are also making their team members uh, feel valued so that they want to stick around. That has been a really big challenge right now. Uh, Lofty Coffee is hiring in case anyone <laughs> wants to uh, uh, <laughs> join our team. I would I would say just for anyone listening too, it, it's always hard to hire people or hire people that want to stick around in hospitality for a while. And part of that is because hospitality does have a reputation for being a temporary position. I've been in hospitality a long time and I always thought of it as temporary until, I mean, even until recently, you always start thinking, well, what is the next thing that I'm going to do or am I going to get some other kind of job? But the reality is, is that's not we're not in that same world anymore. And and there are places where that is true. Say at in some beach towns here in Cal in Southern California, I think that that reputation maybe is assumed a little bit more because of our beach town location. But it is still a year round job. And I'm going to say something that maybe you wanted to and didn't, but and you can tell me if I'm wrong. But it's a pain in the ass to train somebody new. When you have a really good employee who leaves, it's devastatingly depressing because it means you have to not only find another good person, you have to teach them all of those things and that maybe you spent time teaching. And so my goal was always to make a workplace where people wanted to come to work and they wanted to stay because the longer they stay, the better off the business is, even financially, because it's expensive to hire somebody and then train them. I mean, those are all hours that you know, they're not actually doing producing, you are taking time away from other things, they are learning. I think I've said this, I don't know if it's on this show or another show, but 35 years ago, when my dad was running a restaurant, a new server would spend a full 40 hours training with him before they were even allowed to serve a table, which you could never do now. He could do that because they were getting paid $2 an hour, you know, plus tips. And that's kind of the inherent issue with with tipping where people go back and forth on that, you know, higher wages versus tipping versus not. Mm -hmm. But that was such a luxury for him to have that training time so that he knew when they started serving tables, they would know everything they needed to know about the restaurant and the food and how we presented things and so on and so forth. Whereas now some, in a lot of places, employees might be lucky to get one or two days of training or maybe follow somebody for a few days, but there's just not as much time anymore and it's too expensive yeah totally and i I like to um like we just went through a really really extensive training because we have a really fresh team um having to bring on a lot of new people and really kind of about like evaluating that and thinking you know if we invest in these people now who we've taken time to interview and hire and if we invest in them now, we'll reap the benefits down the line. 
And so is that is that because you're actually even though you were just open a new cafe, you're kind of reopening like five other cafe cafes too. Yeah. I mean, yep. over the last month or two, like to a full schedule. Exactly that. And then actually, this is a perfect a non plan planned segue, but a planned a segue into these other uh, areas of sustainability. Something we also are introducing is ceramics. We just started within the last month or so brought ceramic cups back into the cafes. And then the next week or so we're bringing ceramic plates back into um, our food service. So that alone, the amount of labor in delivering food and beverage to people, the amount of labor of busing those, those dishes of washing those dishes, it's, it is so much like it is not so simple as like okay let's put these back like it has been a constant uh relearning for a lot of people on how to operate using these other (laughs) types of dishes and stuff like that so again back to the kind of that main question you asked about sustainability i kind of wanted to break it down with that and then talking about the cafe and then talking about the like the production and green coffee that is such a complicated issue in the cafe setting. I may have actually mentioned this the last time we talked, but James Hoffman did a really amazing video about the difference between like single use cups and reusable cups and how you want to think ceramics actually like, you know, we wash them, you don't throw them away, it's less waste, but there's actually going to be more waste in these other ways, you know, talking about labor, you know, if you have to have two more staff on, that's their emissions from their cars that they use getting to work. Uh, It's the amount of how much water and other other energy uses are being used to actually wash these dishes. Um, And then, so there, the, he says it a little bit more eloquently than I am right now of really evaluating what is sustainable. Is sustainability just reducing the, the waste that's going into landfills? Um, there's also all these other things that are creating waste in a way. So it's, and I, I don't really know, honestly. And I think, <laughs> and like you mentioned at the top, there's there's things that say recyclable and compostable, but depending on where you put it and how you actually are recycling or composting it, it may actually not end up being properly recycled or properly composted. Uh, So that's also very, it's, it is a very interesting and hard thing to navigate. And even for myself outside of work at home, trying to figure out how to properly recycle the things that I'm consuming. It's just a very comprehensive and nuanced issue and finding the places where you can provide value or or ways that you feel that you can make an impact. Mm-hmm. I think when you start going down the rabbit hole, it can get very depressing yeah. because every time you learn something and you get excited about it, then you learn something else later that maybe it wasn't what you thought or there was an unintended consequence. And Mm-hmm. I think humanity should have a slogan and it's like humans unintended consequences. Like that seems to be something that we are very, very we don't see those things. And some, it's not, it's not because people aren't trying. It's because it is that complicated. And, yeah. you know, even my wife, I'm an extremist about a lot of things. And one might say some compulsiveness comes into play when I get fixated on an idea of saving, you know, or not using plastic, say, or whatever it might be. But the other day she, she stopped and got a a cup of coffee and, you know, came home and she had put the, the to go coffee cup in the recycle box. And I was like, well, that's, you can't recycle that. She's like, what do you mean? It's like cardboard. And I'm like, well, it's waxed and it's got this, this film Mm -hmm. on it. It's, you can't recycle it. And she just was in shock. And it's like, and I was kind of like, well, you live with me. Like we should know, (laughs) like we should know the same things about recycling, Mm -hmm. but we don't. And we live together and we have, you know, for 18 years. So it is very complicated and it's it's a challenge for any cafe or restaurant or individual. And so knowing that you are, I think half that half of uh, the battle is saying, okay, we are working towards understanding and putting things into action and we yeah. will adjust as we go, but it's likely that we don't have the right answers for everything today. 
some suggestions that I would have though, that to me, I think could, could make those impacts because, you know, it's all about these small things that if we're all doing collectively, we'll maybe make a bigger impact. And some things that come to mind is, and thankfully at Lofty, we are starting to accept personal cups. That's a really great way to reduce waste in the cafe. Um, You know, bringing in your reusable, whether it be in a ceramic or like a double walled cup and and getting your coffee in there instead of a to-go cup. Uh, another thing is, it's funny to say this as like we're in retail and stuff, but, you know, buy a bag of coffee and brew coffee at home and, you know, maybe treat yourself a couple times a month to getting coffee outside, like from another cafe. Yeah. Did they change that? Was there a rule against, I know every cafe was going to go cups only because of COVID. Was there an actual rule that said you could, or you couldn't do that? Cause that's something where I'm at now, like I'm finally at a point where I feel comfortable. I could go to a cafe, but I don't want to use the takeout cups. You know, it's like I could just make it at home. I don't have to do that. That's one way I could stop. Yeah. Wait, are you, where was the question? I was wondering if there was a COVID law protocol where you weren't allowed to let people do reusables or bring their own mug, for example. And if that changed. I don't think it was like a law or a rule. And I think it was more individual businesses. A big part for Lofty was uh, really actually throughout all of COVID, it has been a team effort in making sure everyone feels safe. And a lot of the like protocols that we created ended up coming from conversations we had with our entire teams to make sure the teams feel safe. And one of those things being if we can keep the team safe by not accepting cups behind like taking things behind the counter touching them potentially touching something else with whatever your belief on how like COVID is transferred <laughs> um uh again learning as we went yeah i think it was just like to minimize the risk for the team so i don't think that was a lot and it was more of just something we did at lofty I don't think I even know of any cafe that wasn't doing that off the top of my head. I think there was, especially at the beginning, like we're going to just reduce touch points. Like where are engagements? How can we minimize that? Exactly. So yeah, going further into ways. So yeah, maybe bringing in your own cup into a cafe, brewing coffee at home. That's actually something in this last year. While I do miss going out to cafes and seeing my friends and trying different coffees, I've been brewing coffee at home a lot more than I had pre COVID. So that, you know, maybe you use a filter or whatnot, but you know, you're enjoying your coffee at home and that definitely can make an impact and also help cafe retail coffee sales. You know, I, I think it would be great if everyone just bought a bag of coffee. That would be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Every, every customer, but then, yeah, I think really where the bigger impact is going to come is on the consumer end at this point um, and really encouraging from the, from like the, the business point, you know, educating people where you can, like, you know, if you have compostable or recyclable products, making sure you're clearly stating that and even showing people how to properly compost things. For example, a lot of coffee retail bags, although they are compostable, you have to remove the valve you know, that, that one way valve, if you just leave it in there, um, it won't properly be composted. So that's another little thing to know of, of being able to communicate that to, to the consumer. I'm getting sad. Now. I'm just getting terribly sad. Did you just sad. learn something new? <laughs> I did learn something new. I actually didn't know there were, so I have a drawer that is just filled with coffee bags from the past year because I don't know what to uh-huh. do with them. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to like reuse them or return them but like Mm -hmm. they're also like nice bags but they're clearly not recyclable they have like a lining in them the foil yeah Mm -hmm. and so i don't know what to do with them but i don't want to throw them away either and so they just i have this drawer and it just keeps getting fuller and fuller to that point where the drawer is not closing properly it's like you know like with uh everyone's got a drawer where they have like takeout menus it's kind of like that except it's just coffee totally Oh, that's funny. Oh, man. So on the other side of things, then I think one of the we have, the one thing we haven't touched on is what about from the roasting perspective? Is it possible to do more sustainability there? Or is it just really a, upgrades and equipment as you go? 
Yeah. So um, one thing, again, to speak specifically to to me working at Lofty and one, you know, one of the first things and was a really deciding factor in deciding which coffee roaster we were going to use is using we, we use the Loring um, coffee roaster that it produces less emissions because it doesn't have an afterburner. And the way that it uses the cyclone to essentially recycle the air and that in turn uses less emissions. So that was a, a heavy deciding factor in the machine that we use. And of course, keeping on your, your like cleaning and deep cleaning help create more like clean burning, um, clean burning air in there. So that's one thing. From green buying, I mean, again, there's sustainability in the producing, but then there's also the sustainability in the like relationships that you build, right? So building sustainable relationships, I can use an example, you know, creating as many, as many transparent and direct relationships as we can so that we can in turn have more sustainability in the coffees that we are buying and roasting and then also i again i feel like we've talked about this but we're going to talk about it again you know working with with producers and co-ops that use sustainable practices um we're actually we work with a co-op in uh, costa rica and we've bought their coffee many times and we're buying it again this year looking forward to getting them it's called copa dota and they have so many systems within their organization to, first of all, they're, they're a hundred percent carbon neutral facility. Um, and then all of the coffee byproduct that, that is created in the processing method is then recycled, whether it being used for compost, turning it into cascara. What's that word that you just used? Cascara. Yeah. What is that? Cascara is, it is the cherry around the coffee seed that is then dried and used and created into a tea. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that. Never heard of cascara. Yes. No, I, I've always kind of wondered what just happened to the, you know, the remainders, you know, after the bean yeah. was taken out, but I never, I never really thought to look into it, to be honest. Yeah. So I definitely, if you've never tried it, I mean, it's not my personal favorite, uh, I'd rather drink coffee than the cascara, but uh, it's very light. To me, it almost has this like apple. It tastes like apple. It's very sweet and light. And some places they'll do like an iced tea with it, which is kind of cool. You could do like a iced tea soda or something. Um, but it kind of comes back to the idea that they have found a, a, a purpose for this byproduct and yeah, it's not going yeah. to waste. And so... There's, I want to just say this for anyone listening too. there's something to be said for, you know, me as an individual, not using, say, takeout cups is really not going to make much of a difference. All of us not using takeout cups could make a difference, but we probably still won't make as much of a difference as, you know, a major company deciding to change the way they, they produce things. So for example, Walmart, I think, is a great example. Walmart, you know, is is this huge, massive conglomerate that creates a ton of waste. But when Walmart, you know, when people pressured Walmart to say, hey, you're putting too much emissions in the air, they were the ones who designed the technology to have semis that don't draw, use gasoline. They have electric semis. And so mm-hmm. by doing that, and they were able to create a system in which the, the semis are not running while the truckers are sleeping. Because of their size, they've single-handedly stopped, prevented, and it's a weird, it's a weird mix because like they're preventing literally gajillions of tons of carbon from going into the air, but it's also tons of carbon that they would have created, but they were yeah. creating it to meet the demands of us. And so who's really responsible here? And, and so the, the one thing I'm saying right now to everyone listening is if there are products that you love, I would encourage you to to encourage the people you're buying them from to try to do things more sustainably, create demand Mm -hmm. for more sustainable products for, for finding ways be, and be willing to, I don't want to be willing to pay more if you can uh, for a great cup of coffee that, you know, is sourced well in a sustainable manner, because that will then that money will then go down that chain and prove that there is a demand for those types of products. 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm so happy you said that because to kind of go back to what I was saying with like building sustainable relationships is, you know, if you are, you know, build this relationship and buy this coffee year in and year out, and there's a demand for it. And we are able to pay a higher price because throughout the years, the quality just increases, increases. And then we also in that relationship relay back, like learning about their practices, you know, communicating in those relationships, how, how, you know, our, our ethos and what we believe in and how can they you know, shift the way they practice to maybe be more sustainable is really, really important. And to back what you were saying, where it, it is these big companies who have this big responsibility, but it's also the consumer responsibility. Something that I have found is like, especially now that it's with Instagram and the internet, it's like so easy to find these like really cool brands that do really cool things. And I'm not going to say the brand name because they don't need they don't need this unpaid sponsorship, <laughs> but um, I found this clothing brand that I, it's like, it's like um, athletic clothing that is made up of recycled clothing and recycled water bottles. And their whole thing is when you're done with it, you can send it back to them and they will recycle it into another like wearable piece of clothing. And I think that's so cool. <laughs> I might be wearing some of that clothing right now. Yeah. <laughs> Are you exactly exactly so I just think something that oh, especially over the, like the last 10 years really thinking about where I'm consuming really everything but not only just my food or my coffee but also the clothing and like really anything like you know in this day and age where it's so easy to just press a button and get anything on your doorstep a day later like could could I maybe stop somewhere on my way home to get that same thing. Like, you know, just, just lots of, there's so many little things that, that if we all did, it would make that really big impact. We are definitely going to have to retrain ourselves as we go back out right now. I think people want to go out and and do things if they can. Some people do. I mean, I have my moments where I, I theoretically think I want to go out. And then once I do go out, my anxiety spikes. And so then I just go home. Yeah. But, it has been very, I have transitioned most of my life into delivery in some, some cases. And so mm-hmm. in the beginning it was like, Oh, I'll just get deliveries, you know, whenever I want. And and over time I started to do like, okay, well, is it not really necessary? I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to get groceries every other week. Or mm-hmm. if we're going to do something from Amazon, we'll communicate a little more and say, okay, we're going to do one order from Amazon instead of three. And we yeah. don't need it tomorrow. We can get it in a week and we're fine. Like, yeah, it's yeah. not the end of the world. And and those are all just little things that I feel like people were starting to do as a collective before the pandemic. And we fell off real hard, real fast uh, right away. Yeah. So I don't want to I know we, we do have a bit of a time limit today, but that was all great information. And we can talk more about some of the sustainability stuff uh, at another time. But I want to touch on a couple other topics today. Sure. One of them is. I told you this was going to be a a big, big question show, but one of them is about uh, sexism and hospitality. Uh, Recently, I mentioned on a different show, but the beer industry in particular, especially here in San Diego, was, I would say, rocked by charges of sexism in the industry. Uh, The Instagram account of a woman brewer um, from the East Coast, Brianne Allen, uh, at Rat Magnet on Instagram, she started sharing stories of women who had been Uh, minimized or harassed in the workplace, um, in some cases, much worse assaults um, and other things. And it was just a post she she put out asking people for, hey, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had these types of experiences in the beer industry? And a few stories started trickling back and she was just reposting them as they came in. And all of a sudden it was like a, a dam had broke and hundreds and hundreds of these came in. I say rocked a little bit tongue in cheek because this isn't a new concern. If you do any sort of Googling, you can find every couple of years, there's sort of some big exposure to sexism in the hospitality industry world. But what I think was eye opening with this particular kind of viral event was seeing it all together in one place. You didn't just see one person's negative experience and you weren't able to dismiss it as a one off. You saw hundreds of people having similar experiences 
or similar experiences in the same place. And you saw people being uplifted and saying, oh, well, I was afraid to speak up and now I'm not. And I'm bringing this up to you as a woman who is the director of a coffee program. Wondering if you have any reflections on that topic, just as hospitality in general and in coffee as a separate, although adjacent uh, industry to the beer world, not just in the industry, but in the way consumers behave. And then how do you address that? How do you address you know that shitty behavior either at work or from a customer and, and as somebody who's the boss and who's in charge and has people who look to her as their leader? Yeah. Yeah, this is... Uh, this is a a big question, and I don't think, you know, this conversation is going to get to the bottom of anything. I can speak about my my experiences and what I have seen within the industry. I feel very fortunate because I, although I've had very blatant experiences of sexism within the industry, I haven't had to the extent that some others have. And so to speak to my experience of it, something that I've found since day one being a barista is you may see some of your male counterparts receive promotions or or a certain level of respect that may not that I may not receive unless I prove myself. I have I I find that and this this is translated to my work ethic in I have to prove that I can be better than I was yesterday and be better than I was 10 minutes ago. And I mean, I think that's a good mentality for anyone to have, but that is something that I almost have this like thing every morning where it's like, okay, I better show everyone that I can do this. <laughs> and um, again, I don't know if, if that reflects necessarily to sexism within it, but that is something as a woman in the industry, I feel if I don't, I'm going to either lose the respect of my team or my customers or, or anyone who that might be that may need to see that, oh yeah, she can actually do this job. I, I think it, de- it definitely goes to sexism, although maybe unintentionally, I don't want to say people go in and like go, I'm going to, I'm going to think differently of this person because she's a woman or because it's, you know, a woman in a field that I wouldn't expect her to be in for, I don't think there's, there's always that intent. Sexism doesn't have to be that blatant, Exactly. but you, you're not getting the benefit of the doubt that maybe a male counterpart would, or even that I would like, and this is, I'm not a, a person in coffee, like I just have this show or when I was uh, running restaurants, I wasn't a brewer, but people would automatically assume that I was the one in charge because I looked the part, you know, I had a flannel and a beard. Yeah. And, and if I was standing near the beer, I was clearly the person to ask, even though my, my <laughs> female beer buyer would be standing next to me and know just as much, if not more than me, they would ask me the questions. And so then I would direct them to her and you could see sometimes, uh, especially if I was talking to another man, they would be confused. Like, well, why? And I'm like, well, because it's her mm-hmm. job. She's the one in charge. Like, she's yeah. making decisions, not me. And so, so yeah, I think I think the word sexism, I think the lot comes with that. But I, I think what I am trying to learn for myself and, and trying to share, too, is there's a lot like like sustainability. It's comprehensive. There's a lot of nuance. and mm-hmm. And maybe we can find ways to be better about it. Yeah. And so again, to my own experience, something I've kind of, ever since I was a kid, (laughs) anytime I was like, told like, oh, you can't do that. Or like, you can't, like, that's like, not something a girl would do. Um, I took that as a challenge. (laughs) And so for me, again, even in, in the coffee industry, I have never, I have had this goal which you know I'm I'm pursuing right now and for me I never thought that my gender or second doubted that my gender would be in the way it like would get in the way of me getting there again there's like I think for me it's like those subtleties like uh, kind of to talk about maybe your friend's experience where like I'll go to an event and someone may not even acknowledge me. And then they hear, I do this, this, and this. And then they're like, oh, oh, yeah, really? And then it's like, it's like you almost don't matter or exist until there's like this understanding that, oh, you 
actually can do something that's like maybe I see value in. Sorry, that's kind of going back to my first explanation of that experience. But I do think, and this goes, I think, with a lot of challenges within trying to create spaces that are more equal for everyone. And that being, although these things are so subtle and so little, everyone, whether you're you're a man, a woman, someone non-binary, trans, black, white, Asian, if you can can like feel comfortable or not even sorry, not feel comfortable, but be able to speak up when you see these things, that's so important because just like sustainability, it's not like one person's actions are going to make these huge impacts and that it's going to take a, this collective understanding where if there's a woman in an organization who wants to be in a position that is like, if they want to be in a position that everyone on the, in that organization is giving everyone an equal chance to, to whether that be, you know, when we have positions within lofty opening, we offer that position to everyone in the company and anyone can apply and anyone can interview for it. And, everyone has like this equal opportunity to, you know, step up to the plate if they want this position. And then if no one within the company wants that position or is qualified, then that's where it goes like outside of the company. But yeah, I think that it's going to take these little actions of, you know, being like, hey, I mean, call like, for the lack of a better term, calling people out. And I think that we don't, it doesn't have to be this like, because I think sometimes we alienate the person that we're trying to get to when we're like, make for these more nuanced, subtle things, you know, having honest and clear open conversations about how a certain person's actions or mentality make other people feel in a certain way is really important. Something that especially moving more into like, a leadership position is learning how important clear and open com- communication is and also being sh- able to like you know if someone isn't comfortable in a in a confrontation being like hey i noticed you're not com- comfortable right now like what's going on how can we make this a more comfortable place so that we can all talk openly and honestly um so that we can resolve whatever the issue may be I would say actually in the last year, as much as I have grown as like a coffee professional, I have grown so much as a leader. And that has been like one of the coolest accomplishments for me in my my career right now is being able to communicate so clearly with people and also be able to like know when you know what, I'm not going to be able to have a neutral conversation about this right now. I'm going to when I'm chill out a little bit we'll revisit this <laughs> um. <laughs> that, that's something i'm very uh, aware of because i have a hard time letting things uh weigh i like mm-hmm. i want to figure things out right away yeah and yeah that's a very specific type of conflict resolution but not everybody works at that same pace and yeah in leadership roles or in relationships learning what pace of a conversations can progress with certain people or within that relationship is I think so, so valuable because if you are not in, if you're not both in a place where you can have a conversation where you can see the different subtleties or the nuances, that's where people tend to get defensive or not understand. And so sometimes it means being a little uncomfortable and saying, okay, I either have to wait or I have to move, move quicker or however I got to do it. But I think, being willing to be uncomfortable to have these conversations is important. Yeah. Something I, I hope to, to be for other, I think that just like that representation too is like, I will, I will say there's not, there are not a lot of women in, in leadership roles in the San Diego coffee community right now. I can say that. And it's tricky because especially in this last year, we've seen a lot of people leave the industry for different reasons. And I do wonder, I'm like, obviously there are women in this industry who 
who want to grow in San Diego, especially now that I would say we're all kind of, the, the community is a little bit more spread out than we used to be. I wonder that. I wonder where, how can we get more diversity within the leadership within the community. Um, And I think a big part of that is going to be representation and other people seeing, hey, other people can do this and I can do this. And, you know, being able to, 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 to show that, to show anyone, whether whoever you are, that whatever it, whatever your goal is, you can achieve it. And I think any role, if there are any roadblocks that are, that have to do with sexism or racism or any sort of prejudice. Like that's not, first of all, that's not the right place for you. And, you know, if that's something happening within or within an organization, I think that's a good big red flag that like you shouldn't work there if that's how you're going to be treated. And that's not to let these places off the hook, but I think Uh, wow, it all goes really, it almost goes full circle with the sustainability thing um, on how it's like, even as a consumer, if you know a place, you know, has these practices that, that put other people out of place and don't give people opportunities, maybe you shouldn't support them. Maybe you should go find these businesses that are more in line with your values. And I think that's what a a lot of this comes down to is like, your values and your self-worth and knowing that you don't have to settle at a place that maybe they they have this reputation that's going to get you ahead in your career, but it's definitely not worth your self-worth and your, your heart, your, your self-worth and your like ethics and your value to go work for some place that's going to treat you like shit. (laughs) Yeah. It's tough because they're then you, a whole, the whole power dynamics of income comes into play as well. Yeah. And need, Mm -hmm. need based work. It can be very, very much circular in a bad way, just as much as a good way. And so yeah, it's a tough thing, but I think you, you touched on something which is essential for the show, which is as consumers, we need, and this is what we've been talking about through, throughout the whole season of, you know, buying coffee from places that you believe in their practices. When we're talking about sustainability, whether it's how they, they treat their farmers or how they are valuing their coffee, being willing to pay that extra little bit if you need to, to make sure that people are getting those opportunities. But it comes, it, it, it applies to this situation too. You know, if you, you don't want to, convict people without evidence but at the same time sometimes like if enough stories are coming out of the same places you need to make a a choice about do i want to continue supporting that place or if you experience it or you see it you know firsthand you can make choices not to give them your money anymore i want to ask you one more thing today and it's a little bit open-ended i know you started the show by saying how you liked how focused it was so i'm I'm sorry for that no that's totally I love that you have the questions that yeah. allow for us to kind of go down a rabbit hole. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, hit me with your open-ended question. Here, here's my open-ended question. Oh shoot, I've got two questions. <laughs> uh, honestly, I'm I totally I have no issue. I don't know if you have time restrictions, but I'm I'm all, all right. good. So. All right. I'm in no way to get out of here. All right. I'm going to ask two questions. One might be a little bit shorter and more kind of to the point. And it, it's, it goes back to the question that we were just talking about. And that is, we, we were talking a bit about sexism. We were talking about power dynamics. We were talking about hospitality industry. What advice would you give to, say, a young person who is getting into the industry for the first time, say, as a host or a barista or... They're going to be working the counter at a cafe. What advice would you give to that person who is looking to do this, whether it's just for a short time while they're young and in school, or if it might become a career? Yeah, I I like this question. The advice I would give them is, uh, first, if you want to be successful in the service industry, you need to be willing to work hard. It is hard work. And this is going to sound real, real harsh, but uh, we were having a meeting and someone uh, brought this up. But if you don't, if you can't work and talk, just work. (laughs) And I think this goes in if you're working anywhere, even if it's like 
you can either show up and fully commit to the work that you're doing, or you can show up and like half ass it. And like the way you do anything is going to be the way you do everything. And if you want to be successful, I think coming in to your job, you know, I think this is another cliche thing to say is like dress for the job that you want, not the one you have and be willing to do the hard work because it pays off. In my experience, the hard work pays off. If you show up ready to do it, the people who are going to be the people to get you to that next step are going to notice it. And you'll stand out to the people who are maybe just coming and hanging out and leaning and not doing, not doing that hard work. If you got time to lean, you got time to clean. Yeah. <laughs> the second piece of advice I would give is, or just coming in with an understanding that in the service industry, there are so many perspectives and trying to have an open mind on how those different perspectives operate within the bigger picture of a, a business operation. Something that I think I've taken away the most from my professional career at Lofty is one time having a conversation with our with Eric, who's the CEO, and him just sharing his perspective on things with me really showed how different my perspective of things were. And then vice versa, like the perspective of the guests, like what their perspective of everything is. And like trying to almost take a step back and like neutralize your opinion and your perspective and see things from everyone else's has then I think furthermore, when it goes to that communication piece, which is so important as well, is that if you can be like, okay, my boss is reacting this way to me because like being able to try to understand their perspective. Um, and I think this goes back to an, a big piece. I, I didn't speak to that question about sexism within the industry, but I think for me is some way I've dealt with it is, um, and, and my advice to anyone coming into the industry is that in my opinion, to be successful, you need to have so much, love and compassion for every single person you interact with because we're a people industry and you know you could be you could come in and you know you could be that person who hates all their customers and I can't believe this person I have to do this like my boss is an asshole like but or you could you know be open-minded and loving and compassionate and try to be understanding for other people's perspective because you're the reality of working in the indus this industry is like you're working with all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds. Like you never know how someone was raised, where they're coming from, what their life experience is. And if you can be open-minded and receptive to that, it can give you a better understanding of how to communicate with them. I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I do think this is really important about that sexism piece we were talking about. And I, I want to speak to an experience I've had with actually one of my favorite people in the world who, who he, he works for me and he's on my team in the production team. But when I first met him, I was like, I don't fucking like this guy. <laughs> I, like he said something that to me off the bat, I was like, that's sexist. Like, I don't want to talk like, I don't like you. I, I've told, I'm sure if he listens to this, I've told him this before, like off the bat. And the more I worked with him, I started to learn more about where he came from and his perspective of things. And through that of like us working together, first of all, I became, I, I was in a position that I felt comfortable enough when he did say something that was like, eh, you shouldn't say that. I was able to, to tell him, Hey, like when you say this, this is, how it's received. So maybe there's another way you can say that or, you know, just I almost would say it back to him and be like, what is that? Like, it's like, I know I understand him more. And I've, I'm so happy I've given him the benefit of the doubt. And we have this like, really great line of communication. And, you know, at the end of the day, he's not a sexist, like, <laughs> it's not like he but because there are these like, intricate, systematic ways of looking at things he didn't think of things differently because no one ever pointed him out or showed him. And again, I fucking love this guy. He's like, seriously, the hardest working person I know. And he's so open-minded. And I love having odd conversations about 
odd conversations for him about, you know, whether it be sexism or racism or, or things that, that are really big issues within our culture. And for me, it's this amazing person to have a relationship with where we can share a lot of different perspectives and then like kind of learn something from each other. So sorry, that was a side <laughs> side tangent back that way. I think that's really important because what you're saying is that that because you guys are able to have this conversation, you are both learning from each other. And even though you had a certain judgment or perspective of him immediately because of things he might have been saying or doing, ultimately you came to a place where you have more respect in that relationship. And, yeah. and I do think there is a concern that I might have right now just with how polarizing things are and how much vitriol there is, is people can be afraid to have those conversations because they're afraid that if they say something that they're thinking or that they're trying to learn about, that it could be taken the wrong way. And there is such an immediate reaction uh, to things now. Yeah. And it's, it's not necessarily like you're saying this guy, he said something that maybe was inappropriate, but he's also not a bad person, you know, at his core. And so- yeah. And, and I have people like that in my life who I'm close with who say, who have said some things that I'm just like, how can you say that, but also be the person that I know? And your actions don't always match up with your words. And so there's something to be said for taking that next step. And I, it's easier when you have a relationship with somebody that you already know and some new thing comes up that you are adjusting but when it's with strangers, it can be it can be frightening or with a new group of people that maybe you didn't know before. It's a very difficult thing. So I think it's it's a very much a value add to say that it is OK to have conversations and to discuss things and not immediately assume that somebody's entire character is wrapped up in, in that one thing. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you're seeing the same things over and over and there isn't that that mutual respect or that mutual learning or that mutual growth you know, you still have to be able to stand up for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And I think back to, to back to your original question about advice for people coming into the industry, I think really focusing on your communication, because at the end of the day, that is what you are doing, whether it being you're communicating with your boss or you're communicating with your teammates or you're communicating with your customers, like the more skilled you can be in your communication skills, like the better it's going to be for you. And maybe the easier it will be to have these really hard conversations, whether it be with people at work or with people outside of work. And then my last piece of advice would be to just be like really open-minded and curious. I think something we see a lot in coffee is like, I'm a badass barista and I can pull perfect shots and I'm really good at latte hair and there's nothing else I can learn because I'm the best. Uh, <laughs> but if you can, you know, maybe you're amazing at latte hair, but what's that next thing you could do? Maybe you could have a little less milk waste in your pitcher. Well, maybe you could have your bar a little cleaner. Maybe you could be more efficient with your time. Maybe like there's so many like nuanced things that you could be better at once you get past that initial piece and not specifically to baristas, but I think it's like, if you stay curious and stay motivated to be better than you were the next day, you will learn a lot. And a lot of that may transfer to whatever it is that you're doing outside of the industry, whether it's goals in a different industry or even just things in life. I always uh, get frustrated in, in times where I have left the industry or I have gone out into the world and worked in for another company or even just in a job interview. And I, I've certainly gotten that sometimes where they go, oh, well, you worked in restaurants, but how is that going to apply? And I'm like, really? Like we deal with everything on every single day, like every type of personality, every type of challenge, and you're doing it really fast this would be something I would, it's not so much advice as it is a warning, but uh, if you're going into hospitality, it goes fast, you know, yeah. like you, everything goes at a much quicker pace and your problem solving has to speed up because it's only a problem in that moment. Not always, but there are certainly longer problems, but like a lot of times there's multiple levels. There's that long-term problem. There's that thing you're always working on. And then there's that problem that's happening right now, this second, whether it's a machine that has broken or a customer that's upset or a thing. And so you need to, you need to start developing some of those, those 
quick thinking, problem solving skills. And uh, that's something that when you leave the industry after a long time in it, I have struggled with is the pace of other of other industries and other jobs, truthfully. And it's okay. just, I'm like, okay, well, let's figure this out now because if we don't, like everything is going to collapse. You know, I feel like it's a house of cards, but it's, it, they're like, well, no, we'll just do that, you know, next week or on Monday. That's wild. I've actually only ever worked in the indus- the service industry. So like, I can't, that sounds crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. I, and I think, what do you mean next week? Or what do you, you know? We have to do this now. It's definitely a different pace. I, I've certainly... And some people thrive on that and some people, you know, don't, but be Mm -hmm. prepared if you're starting out. So my last question for you today, I might have to break this into two shows, Siri. This has been so much good content. I know. We only put an hour in. (laughs) I do get people that complain that the shows aren't long enough. So maybe we'll try this out. But cool. the last thing, one, uh, I want to say your willingness to share what you know about coffee with me and the listeners, the people who love coffee, it's just incredibly generous. So thank you for that. Um, I didn't want to forget to say that, but I also want to close by asking you that as someone who's dedicated a significant portion of her life to coffee, to learning about coffee, you clearly have a love for what you're doing. I'm wondering what does coffee mean to you? When you think about coffee and all the things that it encompasses in your life, what is, what is that, uh, how does that leave you feeling and what does that mean? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, also, uh, I think I appreciate it cause it's, it, it challenges me to be reflective on this thing that I put literally most of my hours into, but what it means for me is I mean, it again, such a cliche, but really like the connections and the relationships that I have, whether they're a blip with ten, like five, 10 minutes with a customer or these bigger relationships with my boss and my team to the friendships that I've created within the industry, that to me is like one of the more important things about life, you know? At the end of the day, like those relationships are what you're going to remember. The connections that you make with people are what you're going to remember. And another, for me, another piece of that is like, whether it's my total obsession with it, but it brings me so much joy. <laughs> uh, whether it being talking a little bit about the advice I, I gave earlier, when I figure out something in my bar flow that's more efficient and fun to do that's sparks joy within me when I serve a customer and they like obviously leave happier than they were when they came in that makes my day when I have a really challenging confrontational conversation I have to have with someone and then we let it out on the table and then we all feel a lot better about it at the end of the day that's like ah, I have it off my chest and I, I feel like I'm now that much better at communicating and I can bring that into the relationships I have outside of work that again, that joy, I just get so much joy from it. And then which is a funny, it, again, everything's connected, man. Um, <laughs> uh, is the, is that, um, that like ability, especially I would say in coffee, but also in the service industry, um, having like the ability to be flexible and adaptable. That's like something I really love about it. And because I feel like the more challenges I have to be more flexible or to adapt a certain way, it allows me to just be that in my life. And, you know, when, when challenges come, like being, not letting them like break you down. You're like, oh, okay, this is a challenge, but there's, I'm going to be able to figure out how to move past this and it'll be great. So coffee means a lot of things to me, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) But I think I'm just so obsessed with all the little nuances with it. And I I don't know if I have a reason why I am. (laughs) I think I, I grew up kind of doing a little bit of a lot of things and I felt like I was I never really got good at anything and I feel like I'm really good at this (laughs) (laughs) and and that's really nice to 
to be good at something <laughs> and to not to know that there's also a lot of room and places to be better. So I think that's a that's a very wise thing that it's not just that you're good, but there's room to grow. Yeah. And and that's something that's important that we challenge ourselves to do those things. You know, for me, it's been a year and a half in which kind of visiting coffee roasters and drinking good coffee with others who love coffee was was lost for a lot of people. And for me, you know, in person, at least in the way you could kind of randomly just pull over for a cup of coffee and sit and chatter inanely with people who happen to be in a coffee shop uh, or looking for that, that was, that was lost for me. That was a void that I was, I think I was trying to fill with this show to be truthful and, and spending that time, you know, it is the second season. So about eight months working on this show, getting to meet people like you and over the internet and spending yeah. time chatting and getting smarter about coffee uh, has really made a huge difference in, in my personal life, just as my mental health. And, and I also feel it can help, help me feel connected. And for me, I think coffee is a lot of that and, and working in hospitality, which we've been talking about today is a lot of that too. I always, even on the days where I hated my job or I hated my customers or my employees, I also love them because it was this, this connection. We were all in this together. There's some, it's for anyone who grew up playing sports and maybe didn't work in hospitality. There's very much a similar camaraderie in that team. You are in this fighting together and you are working, 100%. Uh, you are working towards the same goals. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but, it, but ultimately hopefully you are in a place when you're working in a place that, that is well run and has good leadership. There's nothing like that moment where everything is humming and everything is busy and everything is going out right there's just nothing like that it's almost like a high that you come out of work and you're just like oh, like every, everything is amazing and uh and that's something that i lost and and i'm grateful for for this show and for having coffee with experts like you uh, to kind of help me keep on the right coffee path so thank you again you're so welcome this is every single time we've done this it's been a total pleasure Maybe if since you're getting back into maybe doing some interviews in person, if you ever, I've, I'd be happy to be on again. <laughs> this is like, seriously, this is so fun. And I get energized talking about these things. And this is like talking about those connections. Like when I go hang out with friends that I've met through coffee, like sometimes we're like, oh, we will, like, well, let's try not to talk about work and coffee. But we're like, wait, we all want to talk about work and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so it's yeah i love this and thank you for having me on this is this is great you're welcome and before we go i'm gonna i want to shout out my cousin dylan Fredrickson because without him dragging me to a coffee shop and saying you're gonna be 30 years old soon you need to learn how to drink a cup of coffee like an adult the show would not exist so thank you dylan thanks dylan <laughs> Like I said at the top, it was a pretty big show. I cannot thank Siri enough for her generosity and kindness and coffee wisdom. She doesn't have to be on this show, and yet for an entire season, she was willing to spend time with us talking about coffee and in shows like this one, a little bit more about life. One thing that I am taking from this conversation with Siri is that growth can happen when we offer others the opportunity to grow as well, and we keep ourselves open to the idea that there are other perspectives. We don't always have to agree, but it does help to be willing to listen and to learn. Most of the people in the world are not like ourselves. They have different styles, different languages, sexuality, and skin color. They have different opinions about movies, books, politics, religion, sometimes even about coffee. What we have in common is the ability to engage with new ideas, should we choose to, and of course, with many different coffees. There are very few corners or shadows of the world in which some form of coffee cannot be found being brewed. It is a shared experience. And in that shared experience, we can find common ground. We've all lost things during the past pandemic year, like going to coffee shops where we could engage with strangers or see our friends. We could draw on coffee cycle to-go sleeves. That last one might just be me. By putting on this coffee podcast, I was able to regain some of that world including meeting and engaging with new friends like Siri, and now having this new roast community of people 
to share coffee stories with on social media. I know that the internet is not the same as real life. I think I know that. But the connections I've been able to make with old friends and new through coffee this year have been a saving grace that I am very, very grateful for. Thank you for anyone who has listened to this show, learned something new with us during a Coffee Smarter episode, or stop by to say hello on Instagram or in the Roast West Coast group on Facebook. And thank you for listening today. We only have one interview left in Season 2, which will be out next week featuring a beer and coffee chat with Mike Arquinas from Moster Coffee, and then the final Coffee Smarter with Chris O'Brien from Coffee Cycle on Friday. If you've got questions about coffee, or for me, or any of the show's guests, please reach out. Send a message through RoastWestCoast.com, drop it in the Roast West Coast Facebook group community, or on Instagram at Roast West Coast. There are some cool people like Kim Zimmerman and Noah Halcott in the Facebook group. If you are listening and looking for a place to connect over coffee, well, you found it. Thank you for sharing this show with your friends. It is true that word of mouth is the best way to grow the show especially when your marketing budget primarily consists of stickers and high fives. That said, I couldn't do this show without the support of my industry legacy partners, Marea Coffee, Leap Coffee, Zumbar Coffee and Tea, Steady State Roasting, Cafe La Terre, Coffee Cycle, Mostra Coffee, Cape Horn Coffee, and First Light Whiskey. They keep the lights on, and they are supporting this program in an effort to uplift the local coffee community, so I hope that we support them too. This episode was specifically sponsored by Leap Coffee. Check out www.leap.coffee, order some coffee beans for pickup, or head to their new roastery location on Saturdays. Bree and the team will be there, and they are great hosts. That's www.leap.coffee, or follow them at Leap Coffee on Instagram. All of those links can be found on the front of roastwestcoast.com, or in this episode's show notes wherever you happen to be listening. This episode of the Roast West Coast Podcast has been written, produced, and recorded by me, Ryan Wolt. I hope this show has found you happy, healthy, and with at least enough sanity to make it through the day. And please, always be sure to drink good coffee.